Hi everybody, we're going to show an amalgam restoration today and this will be on a large MO preparation. This preparation was completed by the company Kilgore, uh, not by me. It's uh, huge in all respects and would not be a typical tooth that we would prepare. The morphology is really critical on the maxillary first molar. Remember that we have an oblique ridge that runs from the distal buccal cusp triangular ridge to the distal cusp ridge of the mesiolingual. And we also have a mesial marginal ridge which has a triangular shape to it. When looking at the tooth from the mesial perspective, you can see that the central fossa is very deep and very recognizable. And then we have these large positive contour transitions to the distal and to the mesial. And you get an idea also of the inclination of the uh, cusp in this view. So we're ready and we're going to be utilizing a Toffelmeyer matrix band. Toffelmeyer was a Navy dentist and he invented the Toffelmeyer system in about 1946. And one of the bands we're going to be using today is a number one. It's 0 .0015 inch and we'll utilize the universal matrix retainer. The universal matrix retainer is really ideal for standard class two preparations. We're gonna place the prongs of the retainer gingerly and make sure when we loop the retainer around, it forms more of a cone shape. Actually it forms like a Dixie cup shape. We have many positions that we could place the band in, buckle, lingual, or just straight away. Typically we like to place it off to the side near the buckle, and that would be the top position uh, or the bottom position, the middle position, is sometimes employed when you have cusp missing in certain areas. It's really important not to use the contra angle and take a look at the difference. The contra angle has a kind of a trapezoidal type shape block that grabs onto the band and it looks very different. It's utilized for lingual placement where the universal is used for facial or buccal placement. You can see in this diagram here that the angulation that's put into the band uh, excuse me, the, re the top of my retainer is such that it angles upward over the lower teeth. Uh, that's the purpose of it, so that it clears the lower teeth and allows you to still create a very stable matrix system. Stability in the matrix system is essential for an amalgam that doesn't fracture. The wedge is a critical part of it. I personally like the wooden wedges of the old school days, not even the anatomic ones, but the wooden wedges that you can get from Wizard and they should fit the size of the embrasure and they have no relationship to the size of the preparation. It's just to fill the embrasure space. If we take a look at instrumentation, the key about amalgams is it's all about discipline and you know once you start with one instrument you want to try to use that instrument as much as you can before you move on to another instrument. And you want to follow a sequence, and we like to use the condensation, fine margin, contour, refined anatomy sequence that I've listed as our way of approaching this. That way we'll be efficient. Remember, we only have about 15 minutes to carve the amalgam, and that's with a slow set. With fast set, it's going to be much less time. The typical instruments we like to use are amalgam carrier, small and large condensers, a tanner, and a cleoid discoid. Cleoid discoid and tanner are related. They look very similar in many respects. And different in others, but they are utilized for doing the fine anatomical carving. I personally like the clear discoid for most of the work with the amalgam. So let's take a look at this case after we've uh, decided to restore it. We're grabbing hold of a matrix retainer and right there and the matrix band is the 0 0.0015 inch which is approximately 37, 38 microns in thickness. If you do the 0.0010 or 0 0.0020 inch band, they're either too thin or too thick. This is just right. So we're going to go ahead and insert it over the tooth. And you know, it's sometimes tricky if you have a tight contact and you have to play with the band a little bit and sort of uh, loosen it or tighten it accordingly. You even sometimes have to create a little bit of separation between the teeth by pre-wedging or using an instrument to separate the teeth slightly while you get the band over them. 
And the objective now is to seal the proximal box area. You can see that we're inserting a wedge from the lingual and it's right there hitting the matrix retainer. So we need to actually stuff it underneath the matrix retainer. And uh, the lingual is best typically, but not always. Uh, sometimes we place bands on the facial, the lingual, or both in order to get the adequate seal that we want. Remember, a band wedge assembly has got to be stable. The wedge must seal the gingival. The wedge must create some separation between the teeth to compensate for the 37 or 38 micron thickness of the band. And finally, the wedge would push the tissue downward. Uh, normally we would be using rubber dam. On the day that I did this demonstration for students at uh, the Stevenson Dental Solutions Learning Center, they wanted me not to use rubber dam because the exam that they were going to be taking did not require it. So anyway, uh, we've just finished burnishing the band a little bit against the adjacent tooth. We verified that we have a good gingival seal and at this point, it's, it's ready to, uh, to get started. We're ready to really uh, place the amalgam. There. So there are several choices for the amalgam. And we like the one on the bottom. This is Kur Contour Admixed Amalgam. It's a regular set. It's a high copper alloy. And it gives students enough time to condense well and to carve well. Once you get more experience, I would probably switch to the spherical amalgams in many situations, but you have about half the working time to get the amalgam completed. But I love the Kerr product. I think it's probably the best available. So here we are. We're going to place the amalgam with the large end of the carrier because we've got such a massive amount of space to fill in this huge class two amalgam. And you notice that we're just getting some of the amalgam material into the cavity. We're not putting a little then condensing, put a little, little then condensing. We're getting it going. We're getting enough material to work with. So probably you could use a slightly smaller condenser. Uh, I'm using a medium sized condenser. It could be just because of the sheer size of this hole that I'm filling. Uh, and uh, the pressure may look light, but it's pretty heavy. I'm really smashing it into the walls, uh, not only downward towards the pulp hole and the gingival, but also laterally towards the proximal walls and the buccal and lingual walls of the occlusal. And this is really critical. Condensation is so important that for many years, the Academy of Operative Dentistry one of dentistry's wonderful academies that's so focused on excellence in education, had a newsletter. And the name of the newsletter was The Condenser uh, because we were so enthusiastic about the notion of condensing amalgam and condensing foil adequately into the uh, tooth to ensure that we have an adequate seal, etc. So the force is, is, is pretty heavy. Um, this amalgam uh, is kind of a silvery look like this and a lot of times uh, clinicians believe that this is not appropriate, that the amalgam should not have this silver appearance, but in actuality uh, the best amalgams are done when the amalgam is not too dry and that we have an adequate uh, you know, volume of material and adequately reactive um, elements that can deliver that gamma one uh, product that we're looking to achieve in the final material. Being a high copper alloy, the gamma two phase is almost eliminated because it uh, it forms a secondary reaction with the available gamma two phase, which is primarily the mercury and tin phase, and the copper forms a secondary reaction to minimize that. So uh, amalgams today are pretty amazing. Uh, the amount of creep and corrosion that they have is so, so little. And it's uh, perhaps a shame that amalgam has been the subject of so much disdain 
and so much mistrust and uh, so much controversy, um, I would leave the the uh, the scientific discussion about amalgam for another video, perhaps. But uh, today, I would still consider amalgam to be a very fine, very inexpensive, and very durable restorative material, although perhaps ugly and, uh, yes, containing mercury, which scares a lot of people away, so it's not for everybody. Uh, it's definitely a procedure that has validity and safety in the patient's mouths today. That's enough politics. Uh, let's take a look at what we're going to do now is uh, after uh, confirming the condensation with the egg burnisher, we now use a sharp explorer to remove, off, remove the excess away. At this point, we're ready to engage in the uh, carving of the procedure. Um, we're going to take a look at this instrument, which is called the interproximal carver. And IPC is a very thin instrument, and it should be distinguished from another carver, which is known as a half Hollenbeck. Actually, it's called the 1-2 Hollenbeck, but the instrument is used for more carving grooves, where the IPC would be utilized more for the removal of excess amalgam in the interproximal area. The IPCs that we use are only 250 microns thick. They're very, very thin, and they're very differently shaped than this Hollenbeck carver that you see here. So I think it's uh, important for you to distinguish between the IPC and the Hollenbeck. Hugh Freedy sells IPCs uh, of, of, in my opinion, the highest quality in the world. Uh, they're incredible. Uh, but there are other companies that make very, very good IPCs like uh, Thompson Dental and Hartzell, etc. So now we're removing the band and notice how I'm rotating it out towards the facial. And some would say, no, wait a minute, why didn't you carve this? You said you're going to carve it. Why did you take the band off? Aren't you afraid that the marginal ridge is going to crack out? And my answer is absolutely not. Uh, we rotate the band out very carefully and now we have access to this interproximal area. Now if we left the band on and we're busy working on the occlusal, we would be limited in our perspective of the anatomy because the band would be getting in the way. I think it's one of the, one of the mistakes that, surprisingly, that, that is taught in many dental schools, to leave the band in place. Uh, I find it to be very odd because, uh, uh, to my knowledge, probably after doing thousands of amalgams, very, very few have ever fractured when you pull off the, marginal, the, the matrix band when you rotate it in the way that I showed you. Um, we're now removing excess amalgam with a cleoid discoid. You could, in this case, use the um, tanner carver as well. I'm going to scoop out the mesial fossa, and then I'm going to, like just taking a scoop of ice cream out of the uh, container, and another scoop here in the central fossa, and then we're going to scoop out a little bit in the distal fossa. And this technique uh, I learned from Dr. Robert Wolcott, one of the famous operators uh, in an early operative dentistry, authored textbooks back in the 1960s, uh, started a dental school in Guam at one time, uh, so a very prolific scientist and also incredible clinician and teacher. So uh, Dr. Wolcott's technique was to then create these grooves that would go into the fossa you've just created. So you're utilizing the information that you have from those initial scoops and always keeping the cleoid, which is the pointy end, or the discoid, which is a rounder end, round end. When you're up against the margins, make sure that you're covering the margin of the amalgam and the tooth simultaneously. So you see what I'm doing here is I'm using a fairly light touch and I'm just utilizing the morphological norms of this tooth to establish the, the grooves as they descend from cusp tips and make a triangular ridge. I'm using the instrument in many different ways, pushing it, pulling it, scraping it sideways. It's extremely versatile. 
I think it's a better instrument to use for this part of the carving than uh, an instrument like a Hollenbeck carver um, because it's smaller, uh, it's more, uh, I think you, you can flip it around and use both ends and get into different parts of the, you know, the, the marginal areas uh, easier. The, um, the basic contours uh, are already there. They were established essentially when the scooping procedure was done and now we're uh, utilizing the cleoid side, the claw side of the instrument to define the central pit, the central fossa, to define the secondary grooves coming down on the sides of the triangular ridges, maintaining the height of contour of the triangular ridges, not making them flat, not carving through them, but carving around them allowing them to remain in their natural state. Looking at the adjacent tooth, looking at the tooth structure remaining, we have a good idea of how to shape this particular amalgam. Now, here I'm using a gauze, but for some reason that day, I did not have a cotton roll. So I used a gauze, which was probably not the best approach because it left a little kind of a funny looking, porous, scratchy surface, but I did mitigate that issue a little bit later. Normally, I would utilize a cotton roll. Now, some people say, oh, I use a wet cotton roll. And I go, well, why do you want to do that? Just use a dry cotton roll. The wet and cotton roll, uh, the water is not going to provide any benefit to the hardness of the amalgam. In fact, if anything, it's going to make it worse. So let's make sure that we keep things nice and dry and, and well isolated. Although, we all know amalgam can be placed almost underwater uh, if it needed to be. So let's... Keep in mind, though, that ideally we want to have the amalgam so that it's nice and dry. And, you know, I'm working into this mesial area, and you can see that we know we have a triangular area on that mesial. So we're going we're gonna to create that area, and we're going to then make everything blend contiguously from one groove to a fossa, from one fossa to a groove to another fossa, maintaining the height of the cusp ridges, the height of the triangular ridges in between. It's all about respecting nature. It's about taking away the stuff that's not supposed to be there. It's not about creating some kind of shape that is your version of the anatomy. You're really just trying to let the tooths own version of itself express itself back out and that just takes a little bit of observational skills to look at how things really are shaped. This IPC is being used to remove a little excess you see that we have in the embrasure area. Notice that we're not going to leave a broad contact, we're going to leave a natural contact. The embrasure on the lingual should be uh, much more open than it is on the facial and uh, we can use the IPC to seal any voids along the margins at the gingival, at the proximal areas, and we can use this instrument to really make a beautiful interproximal shape. So now we're kind of nearing the end. I know I have a lot of time left in the video, so there's a lot of playing around with the, the amalgam, so if you feel compelled to toggle forward, skip forward, please do so. But for those of you that really want to sit back and, and watch how I go about the finessing at the end, I think you might find this interesting. Now I'm using a brand new, brand new, sharp, beautiful Hollenbeck carver. And I like the fact that the Hollenbeck has got a more acute point on the end of it compared to the cleoid or the discoid. Obviously the cleoid would be used for this not the discoid. So uh, the Hollenbeck Carver is, is a beautiful instrument, just it's not very good for the interproximal. It's too thick and it doesn't have the adequate shape to get into the small embrasure areas. Now, so there it is. You see that? That's the triangle. And you remember from the first part of the video, and you can see it in the premolar adjacent. Look at the second premolar adjacent, how it has that triangular form. And um, these little things are, are really cool to do 
because they, they just register natural morphology when you carve this in. Um, the contours of the triangular ridges are essentially where we want them. There may be a little bit of, of uh, areas that are wiggly and wobbly and they can be sort of smoothed off a little bit, but I think you get the idea. I'm now going to use uh, something kind of funny to wipe off the surface and I'm going to use a Robinson bristle brush and you could you could spin this in the handpiece if you wanted to or you could also uh, just twirl it, twirl it in your in your hands. Um, the, the Explorer now is just there to remove a little bit of maybe lack of consistency in some of the grooves and then we utilize that little Robinson bristle brush to twist it and twirl it and it, you could use you know any type of small soft uh, brush for this purpose. Um, there was the brush it just came in came out and then um, that's it really I mean this is almost real time probably just a little bit a shortened compared to how long it would actually take and, you know, I think the start to finish on an amalgam should probably be around 20, 25 minutes. And I tell students when they're, when they're preparing for the exam, it's a good idea to, to give yourself, you know, maybe 30 minutes or so to complete the procedure. Thank you.